Uh, Seth Itzkan, thanks for thanks for being here. Love your background screen here. Um, soil for climate. And uh, I was introduced to that at a grass-fed exchange conference several years ago, pre-COVID. Um, and kind of been following what Seth's done. He's been a guest on our podcast, kind of when we kicked that thing off um, a little over a year ago. And we've been in communication. He's like, hey, we, what are you up to? And like, okay, that's what we're up to. Maybe we should combine forces. So let's do it. And we're going to talk about, um, well, don't laugh us out of the room. We're going to talk about climate change, you guys. Because ranchers were kind of like, oh, that's just, that's just that greeny stuff. But, uh, <laughs> but I really like Seth's take on it because he comes at it from a science base. And also he's pro-cow. So let's hear it. All right. I, I guess that's a segue, right? You bet. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jared, first, can you confirm that you see my title slide, Ruminants to the Rescue? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We can also see the rest of your background screen. So I think if you hit the um, presentation button, we'll just be able to see your just the slide and not uh, everything else. Oh, hang on. How's uh, that? Is that better now? Yeah, there we are. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Okay, great. Well, first of all, um, Jared, thank you so much for inviting me to the uh, Regenerative Legacy Summit. And uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here. And I just want to give a real big, sincere shout out to all the producers who um, are online here. You're really the heroes in this. And, um, you know, frankly, if you weren't doing your work, I would have nothing to say. Um, there are, there'd be no examples to point to. So really from the bottom of my heart, um, as a climate activist, which I am, um, the producers who are um, on this call right now with Jared and, and doing the good work of trying to heal the land, you know, while producing food and meat, particularly grazing, you're, you really are the heroes. Um, of, of the future. And I just want to be really clear about that. And, um, and there's two type of audiences. I, I typically speak to the science um, crowd, UN policy types, um, you know, nonprofit environmental organizations. And I'm, I'm, I'm typically advocating for grazing as a climate solution. That's my, my typical role. Um, I don't usually talk to ranchers or producers who I imagine are mostly here. Um, I have nothing to tell you about grazing. You know how to do that much better than I can possibly even imagine to tell you. But um, so my message for you is don't be afraid of the climate change narrative or movement. I think it's unfortunate that um, you know, meat and, and uh, you know, and livestock are being so vilified. But frankly, let, let me, <laughs> let me handle that. Like, like, that's my job to, to, to push back on that. Um, but um, climate change is real. And, and um, you don't need to be afraid of discussions about it. In fact, you can embrace it because you are the solution. You're a very big part of the solution. So to the, the the two audiences who may be on this call today, the policy types, um, media types, there's a lot of people from LinkedIn, environmental groups who I know are, are coming to this. And the, a lot of the people in my regular network of environmental groups, you know, might be, um, you know, the type who are skeptical of ruminants as a climate solution. Um, but then I also have the, the the producer types who are skeptical that global warming is a problem. <laughs> so it's interesting, but, but both are true. Global warming is a problem and ruminants are a solution. And um, managing ruminants in a way that restores soil, as I say in my title slide here, um, yeah, is, is essential. It's essential to reverse global warming. We aren't going to solve that problem without, in fact, significantly increasing the number of ruminants on the land and managing them in a way which is a proxy or facsimile 
for their wild cousins. Um, so with that all said, just jumping into it a little bit about us. Soil for Climate is a, a global movement now. We've got over 36,000 people in our in our Facebook group and, um, and a, a good mixture of producers and scientists and policy types. And that's that's what sort of warms my heart. I want to see that that interaction there of the different types of communities. But but typically I go to policy and climate meetings. But you know, more and more we are getting involved on the ground and supporting projects on the ground. And, and I'm very excited with what we're doing in East Africa now. Uh, multiple projects that we're supporting in East Africa, all using animals to some extent. Um, and and the Maasai herding projects in Kenya and Tanzania, which are almost entirely animal focused or ruminant focused, but not 100 percent. There was a, a bee program, you know, um, so, you know, making honey, but, you know, predominantly on, on ruminants. And um, and then, you know, at the policy level. So that's Bill McKibben is sort of the founder of the modern climate movement with me, 350.org. And there's Ratan Alal, you know, considered by many to be the father of modern soil science. So to the extent that we can bring this together, the soil science, the climate world, the environmentalists, the ranchers and grazers, food producers in general, then, then we're doing our job. And then, of course, the young generation, you know, just getting kids uh, involved um, is obviously going to be helpful. Um, so, you know, so the major sort of technical point is that for um, you could you could sort of say we're we're a grasslands planet or certainly grasslands are the dominant ecosystem type on the landed surface of the planet you know most of the planet is ocean obviously but on the landed surface of the planet grasslands are the dominant ecosystem type and um and they love carbon they're 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 uh massive uh reserves of carbon and that carbon all got there through photosynthesis and it all came out of the atmosphere um and this is just a another way of looking at the previous slide but with some more um citable detail um this is from uh from white at all 2000 they estimate about 40 percent of the landed surface of the earth is is in grasslands and about 35 percent of terrestrial carbon is in grasslands just so you know, these estimates vary widely. There's all kinds of debate about what's a grassland and well, a desert is grassland. Well, a desert could be a former grassland. And in the Northern Siberia areas now, you know, the permafrost, you've got a lot of evergreen trees there, but it didn't used to be like that. There actually used to be massive grasslands with megafauna through there. A lot of carbon stored in soil. So even what is a grassland and what percentage of the earth is it is, hugely variable depending on what assumptions you make in in your initial um uh, or what conclusions you make based on your initial assumption but the point is it's a lot <laughs> everyone agrees it's a lot it's the largest ecosystem type and by ecosystem type it's the one with the the highest percentage of carbon um but you know when we talk about grasslands most most interior most continental interiors are some type of system like this your sort of classic um, grass ruminants, prodigious herds of, of ruminants, you know, hundreds of millions of, of animals in, in a continental area. Um, this, you know, this is, this is what we're talking about. And most of the planet really is some type of system like this. Um, it also is a, a seasonal rainfall, a semi-arid a semi system. Um, most of the world really, most of the land and surface of the world really is in some type of system like this. And um, in terms of North America, I refer to it as, as an animal continent um, and just get can't overemphasize the importance of animals in the ecosystem viability and in the climate stability itself. Um, and now this slide really, um, just gets right to the point. This was from an exhibit of the U.S. Botanical Society, um, and it was called Exposed, the Secret Life of Roots. And what you see here are actual plants 
perennial grassland plants um, uh, um, in front of a, a backdrop, you know, of, of a photograph of a, of a, of a cross section. But those are real plants being held up with with supports, and and you can see. By the way, when I move my mouse, do you do you see it? Do you, when I like highlight a certain area, are you seeing that? Yes, uh, you are. Okay, C can you see that it's even folded here? You, you see the fold. Yeah. Yes. I mean, this yeah. this plant, for example, would come all the way down to here. And we're talking about nine foot root systems. You know, this is what the bread basket of most continents used to be like. So whether we're talking about Ukraine or Iowa, right? This is what it used to be like. And um, and if if they were to redo this, this um, exhibit, I would advocate for them to put animals up here. So you see that there's grazing animals up here and then burrowing creatures in here as well to give it a more complete sense of what's going on. Now, uh, let's go back to this. This exhibit was supported by the work of this fellow, uh, Dr. Um, Jerry Glover. Um, I don't know if you people here know of him, but you should. Um, he's someone you should know. He did the work for the Land Institute on the perennial wheat, right? I'm hoping some people know who I'm talking about here. And so he's actually preparing, you know, he's preparing the work for this exhibit. Um, but very important person, very important research. And, um, and, you know, so you see the two types of systems there, right? The annual crop, I guess that was an annual wheat and a perennial system. And then, um, this is another just great picture. You, this picture is, oh, it goes around the internet a lot and, and for good reason now, but look at this mock-up or markup of it which really kind of gets to the point. Agriculture, and this is nature here. I didn't do this markup, someone else did, but but anyway, you, you see where the root system ends here. It's like above his hat. And and look here. So this is this is carbon. That's why the soil is dark. This could be as much as 8% carbon, you know, in Iowa and the good tall grass prairie. And let me just put in a little editorial here. So much of the research that is disparaging livestock as a climate solution, they only measure to 15 inches, 30 centimeters. Um, and they say, oh, well, um, cows can't be carbon negative because you can't absorb their emissions in the top 15 inches. I'm like, oh, <laughs> hello, <laughs> this, is, this is over two meters deep here. So, so it's sort of absurd that the conventional science is still stuck in 15 inches slash 30 centimeters. So that's, if you will, that's my job. That's what I do. I go around the world to these meetings and I try to push back against those um, papers that do these assessments only here, because this is what they know. They, th th that's the whole evolution of the extension service in the first place was to help farmers figure out what inputs they needed for their annual crop, right? You don't need an extension service to, to tell you what inputs you need for perennial pasture. So, so the, the evolution of soil sampling itself was specifically only at the top few inches, specifically so you could find out what inputs to put in. It was never intended to realize you know, how great your soil carbon pool was. So even the evolution of the extension service and of and of soil science and, and, and soil monitoring itself is derived largely from the industrial agricultural system, which just profoundly overlooks the the reality of, of a natural perennial pasture system. And so that and so what I've done now is I've I've combined the two into this. Okay, so um, then moving forward, um, uh, here is um, an, an, inf an info chart on where the major carbon pools are um, in the world. So the numbers that you see here are gigatons or billions of tons of carbon. So wherever you see a number that's 
billions of tons of carbon. Um, and the oceans and the deep oceans, uh, again, there that that's obviously like, um, you know, where where most stuff is anyway. Most of the world is in the oceans, but but we're not. There's sort of a limit to what we can do in that space. Where we need to be concerned with this side, with the terrestrial sphere, and um, most carbon in the terrestrial sphere is in soil. So where it says 2,300, that's 2,300 billion tons or 2.3 trillion tons of carbon. Now, now look at plant biomass, 550. Look at the atmosphere, 800. 550 and 800, you know, is 1350. So, so, and even 2,300 is considered low. I've seen it as high as as three, 3,000 uh, billion tons. At any rate, the point is there's there's almost twice as much carbon in soil as there is in plant biomass, oops, plant biomass and the atmosphere combined. So the atmosphere and plant biomass combined is still only about half of what's in soil. Soil is a major carbon pool. Now there's also the fossil pool, um, but until we started drilling for it, that was locked away forever, you know, more or less forever. So we're basically, you know, drilling down into this fossil pool. Um, otherwise, it would be there forever. It wouldn't be part of the ambient, you know, sort of cycling of uh, of respiration and 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 drawdown of carbon. Um, so it takes a lot of effort to, to get this pool, but we're doing it. Um, but of course, we're also adding carbon to the air by plowing soil. Um, and so the whole point of regenerative agriculture and regenerative grazing is to get the carbon back in the soil. It seems pretty straightforward. Um, here is just sort of a simplified way of looking at the previous graph. Um, these numbers, again, each number means a billion tons. A giga is the same as a billion. Um, this is an annual thing. It's it's sort of painful to be in this work because these numbers are changing in real time. So when this graph was made a few years ago, it was 8.9 gigatons of carbon per year being admitted by humans, but it's already like 11 now. I mean, just in the few years that since this graph was made, th these numbers are already, you know, wrong. Um, but regardless of the number, the the flow is still correct. So the admissions, there's only three places they can go into the atmosphere, into the ocean, or back into what's called the terrestrial sphere. These two are bad. In the ocean, it causes global warming and other problems. Uh, the ocean, I'm sorry, causes a carbonic acid, which dissolves coral reefs. In the atmosphere, of course, global warming. Um, but the terrestrial sphere is a good thing. You want that. <laughs> um, the more, the better. Um, and so the, the traditional role of the climate movement is to limit this. You know, the whole 99.9% .9 of the climate movement is to limit the admission, emissions. And that's good. You know, I'm, I'm glad they're doing that. We need to do that. But you see, there needs to be much more focus on this. By the way, you do see the mouse when I'm going like this. You, you people yes. see it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's my role. That's the role of soil for climate is right here. And the role of regenerative grazing is a huge part of it. Look, it's not the only part, you know. Um, okay, I'll get to Susan Solomon in, in a second. You know, th there are other ways to get soil, uh, to get carbon in soil you know, cover crops, you know, we'll get to that reforestation. But again, most of the world is some type of grassland ecosystem that co-evolved with ruminants. And so ruminants managed properly will be an essential part. And I would say the biggest part of getting more carbon into the terrestrial sphere. Um, and then getting back to the climate side of things, Susan Solomon, one of the most respected climate scientists in the world, uh, a stellar resume, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, 
French Academy of Sciences, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, very high respected scientist. In, um, in 2009, she authored this paper, Irreversible Climate Change Due to Carbon Dioxide Emissions. Just so you know, in conservative science publications, this people don't like to use this word irreversible like you got to be pretty certain of yourself to put a word scientists are cautious and they tend not to would prefer not to use words that are can be so pinned down but there she is irreversible climate change due to carbon dioxide emissions this paper shows that the climate change that takes place due to increases in carbon dioxide concentration concentrations is largely irreversible for a thousand years after emissions stop. And then here are the graphs from the paper. So here's time or years. So she goes out about a thousand years. Here's CO2 concentrations. She says, even if we have a, a spike and then stop, you know, th there's a warming lag. The oceans continue to warm for decades, or she says for centuries. It, it, the warming doesn't just stop, you know. Um, so, so she says the average uh, ocean temperature and the thermal expansion of the oceans will literally continue for a thousand years at least. Um, so it's not enough just to stop the admissions, although we have to. And then four years later, the IPCC. Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So this is their 2013 Summary for Policymakers report. A large fraction of anthropogenic climate change resulting from CO2 emissions is irreversible. So if you follow the, the you know, the publications the way I do, you know, okay, <laughs> you know, they're referring to Solomon, they're referring to Susan Solomon 2009, to use that word on a multi-century to millennial timescale. So this is clearly referring to her work. But, but, but look at the second part of this sentence, except in the case of a large net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere over a sustained period. There, there's, there's the raison d'etre for soil for climate. That's what we are. We're the second part of this sentence except for the case of a large net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere over a sustained period. And so like, if the presentation ended now, and it, it could, I um, mean, I got a lot more slides. This, this is the key thing right here, right there. That defines our reason for existing. We have to advocate for this large net removal over a sustained period and that's where regenerative agriculture and regenerative grazing and and all that comes in. Um, you know, about, as you, about seven as minutes, you, Seth. Yeah. Seven minutes. OK, so as usual, um, you know. I, I always spend too much time up front, but I, everything I said, I think is worth it. So I don't mind showing you. Do you see my slides anymore? Or did I kill that? Uh, yeah, so it went offline. We just see the like the thumbnails of them now, but okay, wait, wait, hang on a second. Um, hang on. We're just back. We're just back to your full desktop. Yeah, yeah, no. So I I don't mind showing you just sort of like you know the larger view of of all my slides in general, including the ones that are grayed out. Um, just so you see, there's just so much information here to to get into. Um, these are obvious. This is the part where I just talk about the different types of ways in which you can restore soil. Reforestation, of course, uh, you hear about it all the time. This is a, this slide just sort of means organics, the no-till. People know about that. Biochar, mm -hmm. that's great. I think biochar is awesome. I'd love to hear more about that. But but the main focus of of my work is in this area, is in using livestock as a proxy of wild herds. And then the savory stuff, I've spent a lot of time down in Zimbabwe with Alan Savory and, and, and uh, you know, I've seen their work myself. Um, and we're trying to replicate that in Kenya. Here's your classic sort of mixed herd, mixed species. Herd. Look how close the animals are. You can see the herders here. There's a guy, there's a guy. 
There's a guy. Um, I took this picture myself. This is my uh, my colleague, Dallas in Kenya now. He's setting up his paddock system. Um, you, you know, uh, these are uh, hectares and acres, the size of the paddocks. And this is extraordinary. No one, no one breaks up their grazing in this part of the world into paddocks this small, you know. And so Dalmas, uh, so soil for climate, raised the money to pay for a bunch of herders from Kenya to go to the Mara Training Center um, to get training in holistic plant grazing. Um, so now, you know, he's implementing that and we're trying to raise funds for it. Um, and, you know, I should say, you know, we are a nonprofit organization. We're trying to raise money to buy animals um, in part and to buy them in a context, you know, that makes sense to, to where they're going. So so honestly, if people can help us raise money, that I'd love it. <laughs> um, yeah. How do we do that? Seth, what's the what's the landing page or the website to go to? to, to um, I, I'll, to I'll bring that up. I'll bring that up. I'll make that the final slide. Let me know when I need to get to the final slide. But. But but as you can see, this is this is me. Um, this this is the, what the spot looked like in two thousand and four. This is me there in two thousand fourteen. This is already ten years ago. Jesus, <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been doing this a long time. But but look at the look at the plant. You see my hand here. This plant is called Panica maximum. Look at the tiny little seeds here. This is what's called a uh, uh, what's it called a, a climax. A climax perennial. This th th this plant will only exist with like the best soil. The soil has to be great for this plant to exist. So this is an indicator plant of things going the way you want. Um, look at the fungus and the centipedes, millipedes in the soil here. Um, this is a spot they call it the elbow site. Um, here's the same spot about eight years later. So. Anyway, you know, lots of lots and lots of examples like that. I'll just jump ahead real quick. You guys, yeah, that's, that's here's picture. your butt. Here's Gabe Brown. Um, um, this is this is a picture of him I took when I visited. You know his soil. I mean his his spot. But but you know Google Earth Pro. Here's property. Here's his neighbor. You know in 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 a uh, rapeseed. You know canola oil. Here's here's Gabe. He's literally like on the highway here <laughs> looking at his neighbor's property. Yeah, it's just, oh my God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and then there's tons more science that I didn't even get to, but you guys get the point. Um, and then here yeah. are just some pictures of our project in Kenya. Um, you know, we're really, we're really trying, trying to do the good work, frankly, you know. Um and so our project uh, was uh, uh, Dalmas' nonprofit in Kenya is called the Maasai Center for Regenerative Pastoralism. And, you know, we're working together. This was at the University of Nairobi. I gave a lecture there. So, you know, just trying to do, just trying to do the good work. Um, <clears throat> and, and so just as I'm trying to help you guys, and he did help me, uh, well, not me personally, but, you know, I'll show you how to, I'll, I'll show yeah. you how to help um, soil for climate. Um, let me just let me just bring up our our um, our fundraising page, uh, and then I'll you'll see that. What's link. the What's the URL for that? Just so it goes yeah. on the audio. Yeah, part. I'm a, I'm about to just do the share for it right now. Um, share screen. Um, Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So just so offer climate.networkforgood.com. Network for Good is a is a major nonprofit funding platform. Um, but if you just go to solarforclimate.org, you'll see the links to our our site and uh, our you know our fundraising site. So network network for good is a is is the platform for fundraising for nonprofits. Um Got it. And, thanks. And and the thing is, you know, I spend so much time arguing with naysayers. Like, I get tired of it. Let's just start to heal the world. And so that's what we're trying to do in East Africa. All right. Well, I'll just wrap it up there. Thank you. That is perfect. Thank you so much. There's a lot of um, uh, requests for your slides. 
if you have the ability to share like a PDF with uh, Margot and me, we sure. can include that. So I think today, I know there's been requests for Steve Campbell slides, Seth slides, and I think uh, there was one other. I'm trying to keep keep track and make notes of who's we'd like to get sent out. But yeah, yeah, give Seth a big thank you. Like uh, what I I see what he's doing is bringing two opposing groups together who are working for a common cause or just going about it in different ways. And so I, I think the science is awesome. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. So a lot, yeah, lots of requests, lots of thank yous in the chat and feel free to converse in there. If you, if anybody has specific questions, we're going to jump right into our next speaker, but thank you, Seth.